This is the Ask Faleschini podcast, where the modern economy is discussed from a skeptic's perspective. Mr. Faleschini helps you distinguish what is sustainable in our economy and what isn't. Not everything that glitters is gold, and not all mud is dirty. The podcaster Mr. Faleschini provides no nonsense advice. He had it all, lost it all, went bankrupt multiple times, and is now attempting to come back from zero with sustainable growth. There are numerous coaches and preachers on the internet that preach about positive thinking and how life is all roses if you just care to see it that way. Well, Mr. Faleschini is definitely not one of them. We recommend you ask Faleschini to keep it real. He discusses the darker side of the current economic reality, the side that's more important for your personal and business finance. His first intention is to help you keep what you already have. Not to be a complete party pooper, Mr. Faleschini will also hint at the earning opportunities in the economy today. In order to please the almighty algorithm, please like, share, and subscribe. And now it's time to start taking notes. The mic goes to the podcaster, the one and only Mr. Faleschini. Welcome to the Ask Faleschini podcast with a guest. I'm proud to present Nolan Bradbury, fractional CFO. Nolan, welcome to the show. Please tell us more about yourself. What is your story? Yeah, happy to be here and thanks for having me. Uh, real quickly, uh, you know, my background is I started out in public accounting, so doing audits for large public companies. Um, I did that for several years, but honestly, it wasn't the calling in life that I had hoped it would be. And so transitioned into private accounting, so working directly within a, a company, uh, and ultimately ended up taking that company public uh, on the stock exchange and was there as their C SEC manager for about three years after they went public. Um, and ultimately, again, kind of was like, I still feel like I'm not helping the person at the end of it. I feel like I'm just servicing a business, not the actual owners or the, the beneficiaries of it. And so about 13 years or so ago, started working primarily exclusively with small business owners, small being obviously a relative term, depending upon what you think of as small, uh, but really focusing my work on helping entrepreneurs, business owners, founders scale their business in a way that not just gets them the financial results, but ultimately gets them the personal life results that they're looking for as well. Amazing. All these experiences in different sectors. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, I would love uh, to, to get uh, as much info of you as possible so that our uh, listeners and viewers would understand how it uh, goes. Uh, what I would like to start first is with basics. How do yep. you see uh, the division between uh, bookkeeping, accounting, and C CFO? Yeah, great question. So first, I'll start with accounting. That's probably the vaguest term of them all, right? I think it can mean just about anything to anyone. Uh, so that's kind of, if you think of like the overarching umbrella, that's that probably captures everything. Underneath of that is where we start to kind of get the the delineation of what sort of services are. And so we have like tax or tax prep type work, right? So compliance driven things. Bookkeeping is really usually, at least how I think of it is, it's the idea of maintaining the records, the accounting records specifically for your company. So Kind of think of it as like the big checkbook for your business, right? Making sure all the activity is recorded, it's recorded accurately, uh, it's presented correctly, that type of thing. So really, again, providing the data and making sure the data is good to be able to be used in the compliance scenario, and then also from a strategic standpoint. And then that's kind of where we think of like strategic CFO type work being it's acting as the advisor oftentimes to the C-level uh, of a business, so CEO, CFO, so forth, um, in terms of helping them understand and interpret the data and help ultimately make the best decisions uh, for the business to achieve its uh, strategic uh, uh, plans. Thank you very much. That was really nice and precise. What I would like to start is something that everyone is um, thinking about uh, right now in business, either starting business or uh, just continuing business is uh, how to get a loan. Uh, we all know that there is a credit score, either for individuals, yep. either for companies. Uh, what is, um, according to your experiences, uh, the best uh, 
uh, way to build uh, credit for business, especially small business? Where would you start? Yeah, so um, the first thing I'll start off is I think it's important to understand that even though, so let's say you, you open a business, right? And you're looking to get some form of line of credit, credit card, debt, whatever the case may be, right? It's important to understand that you're going to have to problem, almost certainly personally guarantee whatever type of debt you you get, right? And so what, what I mean by that really is when you think of a business, you think of it as being a separate entity from you as the individual. And that's oftentimes why we created businesses for legality purposes to sort of separate the risk of the business from our personal side. So there's no sort of blending there. Uh, this is sort of the one scenario where you're probably not going to get away from that, though. Uh, almost any bank, especially regardless of how long you've been around, truthfully, is going to is most often going to want some sort of collateral. And in most cases, the businesses don't have collateral on hand, uh, especially new businesses, to provide that to a bank. And so in that case, you're going to have to personally guarantee it, I mean that you, the individual, are going to have to basically say, yes, I will repay this loan personally if something happens to the business. That's the first thing I sort of just want to get out there because I think that can be, I don't want to say a scary thing, but if you've never done it before, you can sort of, it can feel a little bit intimidating. Like, what am I guaranteeing? Like, I have to pay this back. Uh, the next thing I would say is, you know, when it comes to actually getting access to credit in, in some form or another, the easiest way to, is going to be a credit card, right? I, just about anyone is going to qualify for a business credit card in some capacity or another. Some are obviously better than others, right? And provide more, uh, better rates, better terms, uh, maybe some perks that go along with it. Next level is going to be a true business loan. And there are many different types of business loans. For a lot of small businesses, you're going to probably qualify or go around getting an SBA loan. Uh, that's going to probably be the most common type that you're going to get. And then the third one that is that you might be able to get is, is a line of credit. Uh, so similar to like if you had a home and you took out a, a home equity line of credit, the same thing can be done on the business side. You take out a business line of credit. And the reason I sort of put them in that order is like, that's like the ease in which you're going to get them, right? The the business line of credit is oftentimes the hardest uh, because it's a revolving line and there's nothing really to securitize it. A business loan, a little bit easier, but you're still going to have to go through a fairly formal underwriting process. And then credit cards, pretty easy to get. You can usually apply and online and, and, pretty, and know pretty instantly whether or not you've gotten some access to something. Thank you very much for all these insights. And you already mentioned something, and that was personal guarantee. And that brings us directly into the risk management board. Yeah. So um, how important is uh, to have a CFO, especially fractional CFO, in terms of uh, risk management? Um, is, is, is the fractional CFO the first risk manager in small companies? Yeah, so great question. Um, is it the first? Probably not. I think the founder is usually the first, right? If we're going to be honest, like that's that's usually where the risk management starts with. Once you get outside of that, yes, that's usually the next the next place that comes that comes into play. I think the thing to understand about where a fractional CFO fits in and, and deciding whether or not it's right for you, right, is that there are sort of these. Uh, um, if you are you familiar with the rule of three and ten? No. Okay, so I'll use this as sort of a reference. Not my idea. I wish it was, but I can't take credit for it. It's the idea that businesses, as they scale and they go in increments of one to three, three to 10, 10 to 30, 30 to 100, and this could be in revenue or in profits or in people slash headcount, that the things that it does are going to break before it gets to the next level, if that makes sense, right? That if you are a $300,000 revenue business, to get to a million dollars, you can't continue to operate like a $300,000 business. Now, when I say that, I think we all nod our head and go, well, yeah, obviously that's like, how can you be something that you're not, right? But oftentimes what limits the company from getting to its goals is that it doesn't evolve and become what it needs to be, right? Part of being a million dollar company is acting like a million dollar company before you're a million dollar company, right? And so the reason I preface the, your question with that, if you will, is that part of being Part of understanding where a CFO fits in your risk management uh, uh, structure and how you grow as a business is kind of understanding where you are in that growth pattern and what you're trying to accomplish, right? And also, furthermore, kind of understanding your personal skill sets as the founder slash business owner. So I'll use an example. You may be the uh, executive of a ad agency. 
Uh, perhaps you're more of a creative than a financial driven person. And in that case, having a CFO may be more advantageous for you uh, in that role and relationship because they're going to bring something more of a contrary viewpoint to the table uh, relative to your skill sets and strengths. Other businesses, like if you were, oh, ran an accounting firm, you know, maybe a CFO isn't as critical to you, to your growth process just because of your skill sets as the leader of that organization. But fundamentally, uh, a fractional CFO is really going to help you understand and interpret or translate, if you will, the data, the underlying financial results, and what that really means for your business and what that, how that will help drive the decisions you need to make to get to where you need to be. Okay, thank you. What I would like to ask you, uh, because I believe a lot of our listeners listen to different motivational speakers. And uh, the phrase that you use, uh, acting like a million dollar company before you become yeah. a million dollar company, um, for me as a risk manager, is uh, something extremely risky because yeah. a lot of people would understand that they can start spending like they already have a million dollar. Um, and that brings us to the cost control. How yeah. important or where can... Uh, fractional CFO add to the cost control of the company. How important is that? Yeah, well, I mean, I, it, you know, I think you, you stated it right there, right? How important is the cost control? It's critical, right? If you, if your burn rate is faster than you're making it, you're, you're not going to last very long, right? The reality is you're going to outspend whatever you're making pretty quickly. And at that point you have two choices. You've either got to close up shop or you got to find other ways of financing the business, either through debt or through equity. Um, where a CFO can help in this or any real financial advisor uh, from that side of the spectrum is helping you, again, understand how you're spending your money, what is the return you're getting on that spend of your money, and then ultimately projecting that out as the business grows and evolves to understand, does that spend need to continue? Does it need to increase? Perhaps it can come back down and be pulled back in. Um, you know, a common thing that we'll see is like, a lot of people will start off because they need to get business. They'll spend a lot in marketing. Okay. Well, as the business grows, perhaps its brand recognition gets stronger. The spend may not need to keep pace with the revenue, right? Like in that case, it's understanding like what is the relationship between the return we're getting on that investment there relative to what do we need to keep doing? Same thing is true. And the I would say probably the most common scenario we see this is in hiring. It's not uncommon for businesses to uh, perhaps prematurely hire people before the need is really there. Uh, and the challenge with that, right, especially in the salary-driven environment, is it's a fixed cost. And whether you're selling revenue, selling the sales you need to, or, or whether or not you have the work to provide those people, you still have to pay them. And so part of it is understanding what is the ramp-up period? Uh, when do you need to make those hires? What are the thresholds that you need to have to justify making those hires? Those are the types of decisions that are hard to make individually uh, as a leader of an organization, or even, and especially if you don't necessarily have the background in making those choices and an outside expert can really help provide uh, the proper clarity on those. Thank you. You mentioned fixed costs and um, I'm a huge uh, believer in, in variable costs. So yeah. I, I would like uh, to, to spend a minute or two on, on, on fixed costs with variable costs. In the yeah. world, all the costs would be variable. But right. um, unlucky for most of us, we are not living, yeah. or often we are not uh, in a perfect world. So, yeah. um, what what would be what would be a typical uh, fixed cost towards uh, uh, a variable cost uh, ratio for you for a typical uh, let's say service industry startup? Meaning like what is the proper relationship like between what is fixed versus what is variable? Yes. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. So uh, obviously I think your question is, there's a key point to your question that I want to emphasize to listeners just so they they pick up on this, which is a lot of it is going to be driven by the type of industry you're in and the type of work you're doing, right? The relationship is not, here's the number, here's the relationship and it's just unilaterally the case across all business, right? Like there are going to be certain businesses that lend themselves more to variably driven costs, meaning that the, the cost 
directly or or at least relationship wise goes up or down in relation to the way in the way you generate revenue fixed costs of course being you have to pay this amount regardless of whether or not uh, you do something right so a good example of fixed cost is rent right we pay rent whether we sell you could sell one widget you could sell a million widgets it doesn't matter you still have to pay rent on it right uh hourly employees that's a good example of a of a, a variable cost meaning that like if you're not producing work you may not have to pay them to do the work meaning that they're only you're only having that cost that comes into play the relationship between the two is can be challenging because a lot of it is how and i'll be honest has evolved a lot over the last couple of years uh, technology has significantly improved the ability to reduce maybe not the the percentage of fixed costs between relative to variable, but certainly bring down the overall fixed costs, right? Things that we used to have to hire professionals to do, we can now use software or integrations or API to sort of transfer data that otherwise would have had to have been done manually, right? And so those costs come down, uh, but this percentage may still be relatively same. Um, as far as what that relationship really needs to look like, ideally, uh, in a, and I think you said in a service-driven uh, business, yeah. is that what you asked about? Yeah. So in a service-driven business, um, a lot of it's going to be driven by what is the percentage of your, your employees that are salary-based. Uh, and so that's kind of the X factor in all of this, right? Because if you are in a profession where all of your employees or all of your contractors are a fixed, you know, a salaried amount, that's going to be a fixed cost. And there's really not a lot you can do about that. Again, in other, uh, there are other sort of, um, I'll say project driven service businesses, right? Where it is going to be a bit more variably driven, meaning you're only paying these people if it's, there's a project for them to actually work on. Ideally, like you said, it's a lower fixed cost, a much higher variable cost. That's going to help you maintain things better. Um, but there isn't necessarily a golden rule of thumb as to like what that breakdown needs to be. Okay, thank you very much. You already touched the, our next subject and the last subject before we uh, close, and that is the leverage. Uh, yeah. Everybody's talking about the leverage and the leverage this and the leverage that. And we know that there are at least two typical leverages that we use in a company. One is business leverage and another one is financial leverage. Uh, when we talk about fixed costs, uh, we hope that we have a huge uh, business leverage if we have certain amount of uh, fixed costs. Uh, would yeah. you summarize and explain to our listeners how the fixed costs with variable costs uh, influence our business leverage? Uh, influence it from the standpoint of how much we have or how we, I guess I want to make sure I answer that from the right direction. How can we leverage our business with business leverage? Uh, gotcha. And how does that affect our fixed with versus variable costs? So I'm going to make sure I answer this question as best as I can for you. So uh, leverage, when we talk about, right, is really the amount of debt that the company has at any given point in time, right? That's what we're really talking about when it comes to leverage. Like what is the mix of debt versus equity and how, how leveraged you are uh, in terms of what you owe relative to what something is worth, right? That's just to make sure we're level setting here, right? So that's the leverage we're talking about. So uh, when we talk about sort of a financial leverage, what we're asking about really is uh, how much have we had to, and I guess I want to make sure I'm, I'm I'm interpreting your question correctly and I'm not misinterpreting it, right? So if I'm not answering it the way you want, please let me know. Uh, but when we talk about financial leverage, we're talking about like how much debt have you incurred to some extent, right? To uh, fund the company at its current level relative to the other components of the business, primarily equity, right? And so equity would be you went out and you sold shares or part of the company in order to get ca cash or capital in order to grow the business, right? So where the variable or fixed cost comes into play in this obviously is um, from a couple different perspectives. So one, uh, if you have higher costs, whether fixed or variable for that matter, uh, your leverage potentially could be higher because you're going to have to incur uh, a greater cost of capital to operate the business, right? So the uh, the operating costs of the business are higher. Inherently, that means you need more cash or more or higher net cash flow. That in turn can result in you having, I'll say, a less desirable leverage ratio, meaning more debt than you would otherwise like to have, right? Um, same can be true though on the equity side, right? Like if costs are higher, 
uh, the cost to get capital is going to be greater, which means that you're going to ultimately end up selling shares of your company for less than you otherwise would, would right? So in, in, in what we're really talking about, right, is that the the cost, the underlying value of the, the business is impacted by the, the cost ratio, if you will, right? So if you're more strategic and you are able to do more with less, meaning that you can generate more revenue with less expenses, predict, uh, specifically from a variable cost or from a fixed cost standpoint, meaning less fixed costs relative to uh, variable costs, then your leverage is going to be better, whether it's financial or, or, or equity driven. Did I, did I answer your question sufficiently? I want to make sure I didn't go out at the wrong direction. Yes, yes. We, we went into the right direction. So okay, uh, perfect. The, the, the most important uh, takeaway from this, uh, I, I believe, is uh, everyone needs a CFO. Uh, if you don't have enough work for full-time CFO, you should have a fractional CFO. And uh, Nolan, please tell us, uh, where can our listeners uh, reach you? Yeah. Uh, if you, we have a website, you can go out and visit and see, learn more about our company and how we work with clients. Uh, that's Bradfield, B-R-A-D-F-I-E-L-D-C-O.com. So bradfieldco.com. Uh, you can also find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I try to post out there occasionally and sort of give people some advice. Um, that's just Nolan Bradbury and you can search for me and find me out there as well. Um, but if you have any questions or you're growing your business and just want some input or some feedback or some help on maybe where to take it next, we do free consultations. Feel free to reach out to us through our website and be happy to connect with you and, and see how we might be able to help you. Thank you. I'll include all the links uh, in the description below. And uh, thank you, Nolan. Thank you for being my guest tonight. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure being here. Thank you, Mr. Faleschini, for this outstanding podcast. And thank you for listening to the Ask Faleschini podcast until the end. Mr. Faleschini would love to hear your feedback in the comments. And don't forget, if you want to know, ask Faleschini or listen to the Ask Faleschini podcast. In order to please the almighty algorithm, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.